Thank you very much. Yeah, my name is Matthias Steeg, and in the next couple of minutes, I want to talk about the security of wireless desktop sets, wireless mice, and wireless keyboards. So, yeah, a few words about me. I work as an IT, IT security consultant for a company called Sys, and yeah, it still pays the rent. I'm interested in information security since my early days. Um, yeah, and I still have fun doing this. I did this research together with uh, my colleague Gerhard Klustermeyer. He yeah, couldn't be here today. Um, yeah, he's also very interested in information security, and we did this research, as I said before, together over the last couple of months, actually. So the agenda for this talk, uh, we have a few points. At first, I want uh, to shortly introduce you to the use technology I will gonna uh, talk about. Then, um, yeah. I will mention the previous work of other researchers, our research is actually uh, based on. Then I will give a short overview um, of our research, um, talk about the attack surface and attack scenarios concerning wireless uh, desktop sets, wireless mice, wireless keyboards. Then the interesting part um, is the found security vulnerabilities. There will hopefully be also live demos. I have one set up here, I hope it works. Um, and of course, there's conclusion and recommendation, and if we have still time, some Q and A. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about is uh, wireless desktop sets. Uh, you can see here on the upper side of the picture, wireless desktop sets is just a combination of wireless keyboard, a wireless mouse, and a USB dongle um, that is working as a receiver and gets connected to a PC. On the lower side of the picture, you can see some of the devices we used uh, for our research purposes. So I, for example, used a HackerF1 uh, software-defined radio. Later on, we used a Crazy Radio PA. Um, yeah, it's a specific device using the same technology as our target devices. And nowadays, you can also do um, these kinds of attacks I show you using low-cost devices like a Logitech unifying receiver, thanks to Bastille Networks, because I found out that, they could, can you, uh, that you can actually reprogram these devices. They cost about 16 euros, 16 or 20 euros, and you can do um, all the kinds of attacks you will see later on using such a unifying receiver. Okay, so how do um, wireless keyboards actually work? Um, what I'm talking about? Well, you have wireless devices, mouse and keyboard, and yeah, they're just sending keystrokes in the case of the keyboard to a USB dongle, and in the case of the mouse, mouse actions like mouse movements or mouse clicks. And the communication actually is not unidirectional, but um, yeah, goes in, goes in both directions. They're not acknowledgments, but they are not uh, that important here. Okay, and our research actually is based on um, the research of other res researchers, as mentioned before, uh, back in 2009 and two 2010, um, there was a Kikari Key in version 1 and version 2. Um, this project targeted, for example, Microsoft wireless desktop sets, and uh, the guys doing it from DreamLab, te DreamLab Technologies uh, also reverse engineered the um, proprietary encryption of the wireless keyboard, and they were able to attack devices back then. In 2011, Travis Goodspeed um, published a paper on a blog article about um, sniffing um, using a specific kind of uh, transceiver, namely the NRF24. And last year, as part of the NSA playset, Semi Kamkar released um, the Key Sweeper. It's an improvement uh, to the research um, done by the Kikari Key team, actually. And in February this year, um, Bastille Networks released several vulnerabilities they called mouse check. Um, yeah, and we actually did something the same. So our research um, started way back in April 2015. It started as a, a customer project um, where we had a look at three specific IES encrypted wireless desktop sets. Um, but we only had limited time and we were not that uh, content with the results and we thought there must be more to it. So we started a research project over the last few months. It was a very fragmented research project um, because there were um, always more important things to do like earning money. 
Okay, on this picture you can see the five devices we had a look at. Um, it was one device from Cherry, one from Microsoft, Fujitsu, Logitech, and also Perix. We have chosen those um, devices by the project we initially did, and then we just did a, a research on Amazon uh, Germany to see what uh, can we find if we type wireless desktop set in AES, and these were devices we could simply uh, buy there. Okay, so our test methodology was um, th uh, three-step, actually. Um, first, we did a simple hardware analysis, so we opened up the devices, we stared at the printed cir circuit boards, identified chips, um, did a lot of uh, reading documentations, um, yeah, and then we tried to find interesting test points, for example, for SPY, and we were also soldering some wires to some interesting test points. Um, next, we did firmware analysis, so we were capable to actually extract firmware of some of the devices um, under test, and we loaded a dumped firmware. It was actually an um, 8051 code of the microcontrollers um, of the specific transceiver um, to IDA and analyzed it. We started disassemblies, we did some more um, reading of fine documentation, we checked the Nordic Semiconductors um, software development kit, which was very useful, um, and we read some more code, um, wrote some sample code, and analyzed this, just to um, get a better understanding of how these devices actually work. Um, and lastly, we also did radio-based analysis, because these devices are wireless, and this is the most interesting part. Um, yeah, how do they work, actually? And what I personally did at first, I watched Mike Osman's <laughs> SDR tutorials. This was actually my first project uh, working with a software-defined radio, and I learned a lot. Um, yeah, I did some more um, reading of documentation, browsed the web, because we found out that uh, these NRF24 devices are very popular in the maker scene, at least uh, the transmitters and receivers, not the transceiver system on a chip devices, but um, Many people are using uh, these transmitters for different uh, stuff. Yeah. And then we also got started with uh, GNU Radio and GNU Radio Companion. We wrote some uh, Python scripts and yeah, analyzed um, the data communication using ready readily available tools uh, from other projects. And later on, we changed our tool set um, to this of Bastille Networks in February this year because it was just superior to that one we have used uh, up to then. And on, in this table you can see the transceivers we were able um, to identify and yeah, four of the five devices as you can see are using the Nordic Semiconductor transceiver NRF24 kind and we focused our research on these devices, so Fujitsu uh, it's still a work in progress, it's another technology, and we were just able to identify one vulnerability in there. I will show you later on. Okay, here yeah, on, on this slide I've just uh, yeah, compiled some information about documentation. Um, it's just very important if you haven't done such a project before to read um, all the stuff to yeah, just know what are you looking at, and it is also helpful um, to do some research about available tools because it saves a lot of time, actually. Okay, and on the next couple of slides, I've just um, yeah, put some excerpts from the data sheet. So this was actually the device in this pack package um, that we were dealing with, the NRF24, uh, different versions in the keyboard and in, in the USB dongle. And uh, the interesting pins for us were, of course, a SPY, because uh, via this serial interface we were able to um, dump the firmware, and we could also um, reprogram some of the devices. This was the first interesting finding, because the Nordic Semiconductor transceivers actually have a read-back protection, but three of the four uh, manufacturers just don't use this feature. And so you just have to find the correct test points, and yeah, you can modify the device or you can just dump the firmware for further analysis. Um, yeah, and when it comes to um, data memory, it is divided in two parts, the non-volatile uh, data. Not all memory is accessible ex externally via SPY, 
Um, so, for example, for the Cherry keyboard, keyboard, we had to write our own firmware to extract all the data that was on the devices. So it was not all um, externally addressable, as you can see here. On this slide, you can see some information about um, the so-called enhanced shock burst protocol that is used for the radio communication. Um, we were mainly interested in the payload um, and not on the other stuff. Um, yeah, but if you have a look at these devices and uh, do an analysis, you have to know how it actually works, what is the preamble, the address configuration fields, control fields, checksums, all that stuff. But it's all well documented. And what's also interesting, uh, shown on the lower part, is that the Nordic Semiconductor Transceiver has support for hardware, AES encryption, and it's actually used by the firmware we had a look at. So on this slide, um, you can see a Microsoft keyboard, or actually a PCB. And uh, what's nice um, from Microsoft is they have labeled all the interesting test points for us, so we do not have to search them by our own. So you can see, yeah, we have all the spy um, things, um, Meso, Mosey, uh, chip select a clock, and we also have the reset and proc uh, test points there. So it was very easy to analyze this one. And yeah, that's an example setup. Um, we used uh, just a bus pirate. That's a cherry keyboard wired uh, the correct, uh, sold at the correct wires uh, on the correct test points. And then you just can modify and read um, the things. OK, and we did not only have a look at the keyboards, but also um, at the dongles. So um, my colleague, Alexander Strassheim, did this one. Um, yeah. And so we were also able to directly read the dongles um, in this way, using custom-made breakout boards. Okay, yeah, and concerning firmware analysis, what we did, um, as I mentioned earlier, we just loaded it to IDA Pro, read the uh, Nordic Semiconductor um, SDK several times, and by having the SDK, it was rather easy to identify the interesting spots uh, concerning encryption, for example, so we could annotate the code section we were uh, mainly interested in. Yeah, and concerning radio-based analysis, we um, started with GNU Radio and GNU Radio Companion and yeah, some self-made scripts just to um, analyze what was going on um, over the air using the enhanced shock burst uh, communication protocol. <clears throat> yeah, and this is just an example um, of our first tries using the NRF24 decoder. We modified a little bit, and here we were able to see the encrypted uh, traffic and some more information concerning um, addresses, PIDs, acknowledgement, stuff like that. So this is just a raw uh, communication. Yeah, and in February, uh, February this year, um, we changed our tool set a little bit um, because Bastille um, released their own tool set they used for identifying the mouse check vulnerabilities and their tool set was just superior to ours. So we also uh, bought a crazy radio that's actually a remote control for a quadrocopter. <laughs> and uh, we used Bastille's NS NRF research firmware and some of their tools and all the tools we have developed so far are based on this tool set. Yeah, and of course, there were different problems um, during our research project. What I've learned personally is that software-defined radio really has a steep learning curve. So reproducing some things at the start is r really easy. But later on, there, when there are some issues, you really have to dig deep and find out what's going wrong and where the error is. But it's um, fun. So I will continue doing um, SDR analysis in the future. Um, yeah, and some things just were more difficult than we uh, first uh, thought. For example, simple replay attacks because there is uh, channel hopping, there are timing issues, signal strength issues, um, stuff like that. And what we also found out is that correctly identifying chips is not in itself because we overlooked at first that there are also uh, one-time programmable versions of some of the chips. Um, yeah, so we bricked one Microsoft device, um, yeah, that was not our intention. Um, yeah, and the other two points are 
rather general if you have a development kit or board where you can just play around without breaking and damaging it. Um, yeah, you can save a lot of time and having a proper tool set makes a huge difference. Okay, so what actually is the attack surface and what are attack scenarios concerning wireless desktop sets? Um, yeah, in our opinion, there are two attack um, categories. One with, uh, with physical access to the devices and one where you remotely attack the devices over the air using radio signals. Concerning physical um, access, what you, could you possibly do as an attacker? You can, of course, extract firmware, manipulate firmware, extract cryptographic keys and manipul manipulate them. Um, concerning attacks over the air, what can you do? Um, yeah, you can exploit unencrypted, unauthenticated data communication. You can perform replay attacks. If there is no protection, you can maybe perform keystroke injection attacks, and you can also try to decrypt encrypted data communication. So all the devices we looked at um, were encrypted, so we only had a look at AES-encrypted um, wireless desktop sets. Yeah, and here are the four, um, the five <laughs> security vulnerabilities we found. Actually, they are only four because replay attack um, is listed there twice. But what we found is that um, some devices just have an insufficient protection of code, namely firmware um, and data, cryptographic keys. So we were simply able to um, read and also write this uh, sensitive data. Um, as seen before using SPY. Then the second vulnerability we found was um, unencrypted and unauthenticated data communication. Uh, we found this one in all the mice we have tested. So only the keyboards are actually encrypted. All the mice are unencrypted. Um, the next vulnerability was missing protection against replay attacks. So most of the devices had no protection at all against replay attacks, and the Microsoft keyboard had some kind of protection, so that's point four, insufficient protection against replay attacks. But there is still an attack window you can actually exploit. And um, the last vulnerability is cryptographic issues that allowed for other attacks, as we will see later on. Okay, so the first uh, vulnerability, insufficient protection of um, code and data. It's a rather obvious one, so I will rush to the slides. Um, here you can see um, sample firmware we used to e extract the so-called um, extended NV flash memory from the Cherry keyboard, because um, in this way we were able to also get access to the memory that is not externally addressable via SPY. Um, and the Cherry keyboard, for example, stores the AAS key in there. Yeah. So you at first have to, dump, um, have to reprogram a Cherry keyboard or a Cherry dongle um, in order to actually get to the AAS key. In this case, concerning the other devices, um, for example, Perix or Microsoft, you can just uh, connect to the correct test points for SPY and read the AAS key from the device. Yeah. And here's an example um, of two dumps from the Cherry dongle and the Cherry keyboard. And as you can see, we have found the same 16-byte value in the dongle um, flash memory and in the Cherry uh, flash memory. And this is the actual key that it's used. Yeah. So um, yeah, embedded flash memory of several devices can be read and written uh, concerning NR24 receivers. There is a protection feature, but it's not used by every manufacturer. So it is rather easy um, to raise the bar for an attacker having physical access if this uh, feature was used in the manufacturing process. And um, yeah, what we also found out is that it's also possible to manipulate one-time programmable flash memory because you can um, change a one bit to a zero bit, but not vice versa. So for example, Microsoft, the Microsoft keyboard uses a one-time programmable version of the transceiver, but you can still modify the key or modify the firmware in a limited way. <clears throat> yeah, and what's also important is that um, some wireless keyboards, um, for example, Microsoft, is paired at the factory. Um, so you have no chance as an end user to actually change the cryptographic keys. You just have to trust Microsoft in this way. 
we are still working on a, a software where you are able exploiting the spy access to change the cryptographic keys if you don't trust Microsoft, but it's still work in progress. Um, yeah, and concerning um, the generation of cryptographic keys, none of the manufacturers told us how they actually do it, so it can be simply random, it can be derived from some serial number or I don't know what. So it's, just, it's a secret and you have to trust the manufacturers um, that are actually building these devices. Yeah. And what does it mean? It means that an attacker with Brazil Access um, can change the cryptographic keys and the firmware, and of course read it. And when I hear this, I always have to think of uh, this picture that was released, I think, uh, three years ago. Um, yeah. So anybody who has access um, to the device for a couple of minutes, it depends on the device, so five to ten minutes um, can extract the AES keys, or it can um, actually um, manipulate the firmware. And here you can think of some specific uh, keylogger scenarios. Uh, for example, yeah, we just extract the keys and then you're sitting in the building uh, on the opposite side of the street or on another floor and just um, sniffing the radio communication for a couple of weeks and you're able to decrypt all the traffic somebody is uh, generating using these devices. Okay, so the next um, vulnerability and attack that is possible um, are so-called mouse spoofing attacks because, yeah, as mentioned earlier, the communication of the mice is unencrypted and unauthenticated. So the receiver cannot decide if it's authentic or not, and so you can just spoof devices and do whatever you want. Okay, so I will show you... Um, Small demo video. Hopefully it works. Uh. <clears throat> yeah, because I was challenged by one of my colleagues. He said, yeah, but it's not reliable, exploitable um, in the real world. So we just developed a small Python software tool called Radioactive Mouse, and I uh, targeted in, the, in this proof of concept um, attack a Windows 7 operating system. And yeah, what I actually did is I opened the virtual on-screen keyboard of uh, the device, and then you can just yeah do virtual key presses there. I sped it up so it's, uh, the attack is uh, rather slow, uh, at least uh, um, here in my proof of concept tool. So I think the complete attack um, has a duration of three minutes. You can see a full uh, demo on YouTube. So um, I think a couple of days ago, or weeks, two weeks ago, we um, put a um, proof of concept video on YouTube. You can just uh, watch it there. Yeah. And what happens here is just virtual key presses. It's um, yeah, a default Windows um, attack vector, download and execute um, via PowerShell. And when the attack is completed, yeah, now it's slowed down again, and it presses enter. Now the PowerShell command is executed. Um, and if all goes well, yeah, malware just got installed on the system. This kind, it's just a, a mock-up ransomware. Yeah, and it's just a demo for remote code execution, wireless unencrypted mouse communication, yeah. Okay, so we've seen this here. Yeah, so the radio communication of all the tested mice was unencrypted and unauthenticated. So if you know the mouse data protocol, you can just spoof arbitrary mouse action, mouse movements, or mouse clicks. Um, yeah, and you have control in an unauthorized way over the mouse cursor, mouse pointer. And this is uh, really old news. So back in 2009 and 2010, the people from Dream Labs, uh, the Kikari Key people, they also had this, uh, they had this information in their slides, but no, actually nobody cares because all people say it's not reliable, exploitable, and it's actually true. Because um, you need some heuristics to exploit this in the real world, so you have trial and error, educated guesses, but in some cases you have remote code execution. And the heuristics uh, concern yeah, the layout of the screen, actually. Then the language settings, you have to know if it's an English keyboard or Dwarak or German, for example. Um, you have to know some information about the mouse settings. 
especially the mouse acceleration that is used, um, and you have to know where the on-screen keyboard can be found. So it is also changed with uh, Windows 8, 8.1, and 10. But in Windows 8.1 and 10, you have a, a split-screen keyboard that you can also exploit rather reliably, I'd say. Okay, and these are the defaults I used in my proof of concept. Um, just the default mouse setting is using enhanced pointer precision. There's a default mouse acceleration curve uh, in the registry. And the on-screen keyboard actually has uh, default position and default dimensions if you haven't used it before and moved it and saved it. So I think in um, yeah, most of the cases concerning Windows installations or Windows Office installations in companies, it's rather reliable. And if you if you're not only targeting one device, but uh, several hundred, one is enough to get access to the company network if the ex uh, exploit is successful. Yeah, and um, what I couldn't achieve um, was pixel-perfect control over the mouse pointer because there is some more research necessary because it's not that easy as I have uh, thought um, at the beginning. Yeah, and actually the mouse movement in Windows is still handled in the kernel, um, and there yeah, is fixed point math involved and mouse acceleration curves. It's more complicated than I uh, actually thought. Yeah, and so the current state is that uh, we are using handcrafted uh, mouse movements that are actually slowed down to um, avoid some issues concerning mouse acceleration. Yeah, but it works rather reliably, as we've seen in the demo video. Okay, so the next vulnerability, replay attacks. This is also rather obvious, and actually I was surprised that it works on all keyboards. I have also a um, demo video here, but I will also try to do a live um, demonstration in combination with another vulnerability um, later on. So, yes, should be this one. Okay, I'll pause the video for a, a second. Um, this is just a simple, s no? Oh, I cannot pause it. Okay, this is just a, a simple setup. Um, on the left, the laptop, you can see the attacker. There's running new radio. You can see um, a software-defined radio. Um, and you can see the victim system running um, Windows 7 that is operated with a vulnerable wireless desktop set. And what I just did is, um, yeah, I recorded the radio communication on a specific uh, channel in this case, and now I simply do a replay of the recorded um, communication. And as you can see, I can unlock uh, the Windows screen remotely. Yeah, so there's no protection um, concerning replay attacks. <laughs> yeah, and um, in this case, I attacked the Fujitsu keyboard, and I don't know actually the protocol of the Fujitsu keyboard. So I did this uh, using a black box approach. I just um, recorded the communication on a specific channel and replayed it. I don't know what is actually going on, but it is easy to reproduce, as you've uh, seen. OK, this was just a setup. We've seen it in the video. Um, yeah, and actually, this is the GNU Radio Flow Graph. Um, <laughs> it's one of the most um, simple flow graphs you can get. Um, this can be used for recording and for replaying by yeah, activating, deactivating some of the boxes. But it's all it takes to perform replay attacks. And you can do this uh, within a couple of yeah, seconds or minutes, actually. It took me five minutes uh, to reproduce this um, on the Fujitsu keyboard. Okay, yeah. And we have also written... Um, other software tools, um, yeah, simple replay, Python script that uses the newer tool chain, the Crazy Radio PA and the NRF research firmware, and you can just um, yeah, perform replay attacks using this, and you have a better output. Okay, yeah, so replay attacks um, are rather obvious and simple, and all the keywords we've tested, all five um, are vulnerable to replay attacks. Uh, Microsoft was um, special because 
it has some kind of protection and um, there's a limited attack window because only a specific number of key presses should happen between the recording and the replay. If there are too many key presses on the keyboard, I think it's about 1,000, um, then the replay doesn't work. But concerning all the other devices, we were able to replay communication we've recorded uh, the day before and it still worked perfectly. So no protection at all. Yeah, as mentioned before, simple replay attacks um, can be done without knowing the actual protocol. And um, yeah, more sophisticated attacks can be done using the other tool set. And what can you do with replay attacks? You can gain, gain unauthorized access to unattended screen lock computers, as shown in the video. And if you can also gain physical access to the USB dongle, the receiver of your victim, um, you can just steal it and replay the communication on your own device, and then you will get all the clear text key presses in this way. So it's another kind of um, keylogger scenario if you want it that way. So if you're able to replace all the wireless desktop sets um, at a specific facility, as cleaning personnel, no one will notice that you've just replaced the original device, and then you can um, yeah, replay communication. You have recorded the weeks or days before, and you can see, for example, passwords. OK, and now the most interesting one, uh, the keystroke injection attack. And here I will uh, try to do a live demo. <laughs> Well, I have to do a quick setup. <clears throat> so So I'm just preparing my um, victim device, but it's only for test purposes. Um, I know I try to do some picture-in-picture picture hack. So what I have here is uh, well, a MacBook Pro <laughs> running Windows 7 as a victim system. So it's not the ideal setup, but I hope that it works. Um, and what I have here is um, a Cherry keyboard wireless desktop set. The USB dongle is just plugged in um, to the device. Now I will uh, turn it on and just see if it actually um, works. So if the device is working. No, I don't want to restart this. OK. So now this device is connected uh, to my victim system. It's not necessary, necessary to see what is actually uh, typed here. Um, it's more important to see that something is um, happening. OK. So now I will um, use a proof of concept tool uh, called Cherry Attack. And now I'll try to live demonstrate two kinds of attack, a combination attack, replay, and keystroke injection. And I hope the demo gods uh, will support me in this one. OK, so what I did is I just started the proof of concept uh, tool. And now I, um, oh, no, my fault. I missed the most important step, um, my radio. Without this, um, well, actually, it should not work. <laughs> And as you can see here, uh, could not initialize. Um, he also writes it there. So this is um, the um, crazy radio PA. It costs, I think, uh, including the antenna, 30 euros. And now I'm good to go, I hope. OK, so here's my attack tool. Now I press um, some keys here. And as you can see, 
I found a keyboard. Um, this one is easy because it doesn't do any channel hopping and there are no timing issues. And um, you can also see there is something going on uh, concerning crypto. And yeah, now I'm ready for the attack. What I will do now is I will try to lock the Windows system to show the first kind of attack. So now you can see the Windows system is locked. And now I just press one button and now I will record all the data communication of this specific device. Okay, so as you can see, it was successful. The screen was unlocked. Now I will just lock it again and try uh, the replay attack. Ta-da, it works. So that's the first one, uh, the replay attack. Um, so you can simply remotely unlock um, screen locked systems. We did not do any range tests, but the people from Bastille did. Um, they were able to do mouse check attacks, um, I think, up to 100 meters using some special antennas, not this one, but um, yeah, it's possible. Okay, uh, now we have. So this is just a virtual machine. And what I try now is um, the other kind of attack, the keystroke injection. And let's see if it works. Yeah, you can see something is happening on the device. There's a command shell, it's actually a power shell. And if all goes well, there should be some malware popping up. Yeah, it worked. So that's a keystroke injection. So in this yeah, combination attack, you can remotely unlock a computer system if you have recorded um, the password entry at the right time. And afterwards, if the system is unlocked, in an unlocked state, you can simply inject arbitrary keystrokes and do whatever you want. For example, installing malware, as in this case. Okay, so back to the slides. Yeah, so this is another tool, keystroke injector. Um, I showed you um, actually this one. Um, and this attack works for um, the Cherry keyboard we've tested, the Perix keyboard, and also the Logitech keyboard. But we did not find a vulnerability concerning Logitech, uh, but still did just um, before us and reported it to Logitech. Yeah, and here you can see an extract from um, the NRF SDK. Um, and what we found there is that there are differences between two NRF transceiver versions concerning the AES counter mode encryption. And what we found out is that there is not a counter used, but a random value. And then we thought, hey, how are the devices syncing? And the truth is they cannot sync. They're just using random values for the counter mode. And this actually is part of the problem. Um, yeah, here's just a source code using the uh, pseudo random number generator for generating these five byte random value. Um, yeah, and concerning the tested Cherry and Perix keyboard, we found out that they are using 128 bit AES encryption in counter mode. The counter uh, generally consists of a nonce, a number used once, and a counter. Um, and we also found out that the nonce of the Cherry keyboard was only um, null bytes, so we have 11 null bytes and five bytes uh, random value for the initialization vector. And by manipulating the Cherry firmware, we were also able um, yeah, to find out some more details concerning the release packets. Um, so a re by release packet, I mean if we um, release a key of the keyboard, a specific packet is sent. And we were able to manipulate the firmware, as mentioned before, uh, using SPY and analyze it using IDA Pro. And we were able um, actually to decrypt all the traffic uh, on the Cherry devices we had. And we found out, hey, if a key release is sent, it's just 11 null bytes. So and on the um, bottom of the slides, you can see how counter mode actually works for all uh, block ciphers, in this case also um, AES. And what we know is all the information you uh, I've circled in red. We know the complete in initialization vector. The nonce we know because we did a firmware analysis. The counter actually is sent via the radio communication in clear text over the air. 
The ciphertext is also sending clear text, uh, not in clear text, but it's sent over the air in the radio communication protocol. Then we know the plain text, at least of some packets, namely the key release packets. And yeah, due to the mode of operation of uh, counter mode, we also know the key stream block. Because um, something exclusive or um, zero is still something. Yeah. We have it uh, on the other slide here. Um, and what is also very useful is this, that there is no replay protection. So we simply have to find one valid key release packet and modify this in an arbitrary way. So we have uh, the replay attack possibility. We can do this known plain text attack. Um, and what we do next is we do some simple math, namely um, exclusive or, and then we can manipulate this key release packet arbitrarily and inject whatever keys we want. We also found out that the Cherry keyboard and also Perix and uh, Logitech are using the default USB um, hit human interface device data format. So we have um, eight bytes, at least in the case of Cherry, we have some modifiers, null byte and six key codes. And here are some um, here are examples of valid values for these um, data fields. And here's just a simple example. So we have an encrypted um, release packet we have an ex exclusive OR with our plain text packet we are forging. In this case, it's shift plus A, so we want a capital A. And the injection packet you can see below. And that is all you have to do to have packet injection on encrypted wireless desktop sets. Yeah, and here keystroke injection in five easy steps. Um, you just have to find the target device using um, yeah, a radio. You have to find a key release packet. This is also a um, heuristic. Um, but the last packet somebody has pressed um, after a, a longer pause, for example, two or three seconds, actually is a key release packet. So you can find these packets with high reliability. You do some simple math, and then you can send modified key release packets as you want and repeat it as often as you want. And what you gain is remote code execution, as we've seen here, yeah, on target systems that are actually operated with vulnerable devices. Here's an excerpt of um, the demo code uh, of the demo tool you've seen before. It's just a few lines of Python. It's just an exclusive OR, actually. Yeah, that's another device uh, we've built because my boss wanted to have a standalone device. So yeah, we had an old Raspberry Pi lying, lying around, um, developed a small uh, Raspberry Pi shield, yeah, and put a radio in there. And you can do an attack also with this. Yeah, it's just a schematic. Um, you should not uh, take such a device in an airplane because airport security, yeah, they have some questions. So my boss did last week, and he told me not to put it in uh, the hand luggage. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and here's um, some manufacturer statements and feedback, so no response from uh, Perix at all. Uh, Microsoft, um, they're still checking some of the issues, um, actually, but uh, some of the problems they just cannot fix or not in the, the products uh, that are already out there. Um, yeah, concerning uh, the mouse communication, they said it, it is by design, so no fix for this. Concerning the um, physical access, they say, yeah, if you have physical access, you can do anything. That's actually true. Um, and it, yeah, concerning keys, um, not keystroke injection, replay attack, um, they're still working on this one. Yeah, Logitech just said, yeah, thank you very much, and we are working on better products um, in the future. Fujitsu, yeah, they told us that these kind of replay attacks are actually hard to reproduce and you need special knowledge and stuff like that. Um, yeah, but they're also, they will not fix this, but in future products they will try to do it better. And Cherry, they um, just relabeled their product. It was called um, Unlimited, Be Unlimited AES, and now they just don't promote it as a secure wireless desktop set anymore, and they will also not fix these issues um, in their uh, product. They're still selling, yeah. Okay, so the conclusion is that all the tested devices had one or more uh, security issues. Um, in my opinion, you can exploit all of them in real-world attack scenarios. Um, yeah, the found security issues cannot or will not be, uh, be fixed. So vulnerable devices will stay vulnerable in the future. Um, yeah, it's just a short summary. Here another summary. So what have we found uh, concerning the five um, wireless desktop sets? Different vulnerabilities here. 
And yeah, our all, uh, the single recommendation is do not use wireless desktop sets with known security vulnerabilities in security related environments. Okay, here are some references and thank you very much for your attention. And I think we don't have time for questions. All right, thank you, Matthias.